Um, we will go ahead and call this next case, which is the Sagatuck Dunes Coastal Alliance versus Sagatuck Township. Um, you each have 15 minutes. Um, Mr. Howard, you may attempt to reserve some of that and you may proceed if you are ready. I am ready, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here before the court. Thank you, Chief Justice McCormick and justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, I want to start out by noting that 23 years ago, uh, my mentor and partner, Jim Olson, was before this court mm -hmm. on a case called uh, Nemeth versus Avermarsh Development. And that case was about some artificial restrictions that the Court of Appeals had created uh, in it, it, with respect to MEPA cases. And the Supreme Court, this court, uh, with Justice Brickley authoring the opinion, looked to the plain language of the statute and determined that that plain language is what is supposed to govern and not, eliminated those artificial barriers that have been constructed to, uh, to prevent people from bring, bringing MEPA claims. And the parallel uh, situation is not lost on me today. What we're asking this court to do is to look at the plain language of the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act and to uh, eliminate the artificial barriers that have been created through the standing doctrine or the aggrieved party language in the statute and, and set, eliminate those barriers and, and uh, harmonize zoning standing with standing um, throughout other portions of Michigan jurisprudence. And I want to touch briefly on uh, what, what we see as a fundamental problem in what I'm calling the Olson standard for, for sort of uh, lack of a better uh, definition. And that is the Olson case is requiring uh, special damages that are not common to other property owners who are similarly situated. Well, once somebody, that, that whole analysis walks us in a big circle. Once you have a property owner that is similarly situated, it is difficult to show how they suffer some sort of special damages because they are in fact similarly situated to the other property owner. And the more folks that you have that are similarly situated, the less likely it is you have standing. And in the words of the, the, the US Supreme Court in the scrap case, that means that the most injurious of governmental actions, widespread injurious governmental actions, go unremedied. And we're asking that this court um, not, not allow that to happen in the state of Michigan, not allow that to happen in this particular case. Now, I always feel like these arguments are better when they're interactive. So Chief Justice, if-, if Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was about to interrupt you and, and see what questions people have. Um, and Mr. Straub, good morning. I'm sorry we started a, a moment early before you got here. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, no problem. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Justice Viviano, we'll start with you. Uh, no questions. Justice Bernstein. Hey, good morning, counsel. I, I always like to look at things in a very practical way. So help me to understand, you know, a person is doing a development or a person is kind of using their own property, their own land. What is the limitation as it pertains to the ability for folks that might not be part of the community or might not be similarly situated? I mean, I know all the case studies, I know all the issues that are relevant here, but, you know, if I were to write this opinion, Explain to me who can and who can't basically have a say as to what somebody does with the property or the land that they acquired. Uh, thank you, Justice Bernstein. That's a, a great question. And I, I, and I would direct the court back to um, the, the standard in, in Lansing, uh, which, is, which is clear that um, the, litigant may have, the litigant has standing and would be an aggrieved party if the litigant has a special injury or right or substantial interest that will be detrimentally affected in a manner different from the citizenry at large. So um, maybe some, maybe a, um, an, an example would be helpful. Uh, that is, 
certainly um, I, as somebody who has visited uh, the Saugatuck uh, in the past, um, but live in Traverse City, I've visited on occasion, I wouldn't have standing to object anything for anything. However, uh, somebody that is a, a neighboring property owner, for example, that has established that they have a unique interest that would be harmed by the development uh, in the past, things like um, blocking sunlight in the, in the NIMIA case uh, has been held that that was sufficient to create that interest or uh, some sort of old or, or uh, action on the property next door that is going to impair somebody's use and enjoyment of their own property. Those are the types of items that have been held to create special damages and that are different from the citizenry at large. Uh, and I think that there, there's actually a really interesting um, comment on that very issue in the, in the, uh, the, the note that the uh, Michigan Law Review note that cited in Joseph and, and his well, Chief, uh, I'm having trouble with your ear. Yeah, Mr. Is Howard, it, your sound is. is yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Your, your sound is a little wonky, um, which is a technical legal term. Can you maybe turn off your camera? It might help. Sometimes that's the, I know you don't want to turn off your camera, but um, sometimes hearing you feels pretty important. So see if you can talk now. We'll see how it is. Does that work any better? Am I sound Yeah, we can. Yep. Wait, at least that sentence was clearer. Okay. Uh, I apologize for the, the technical difficulties. Um, no, and Council, I understand. I'm, I'm, I, I understand the case law. I'm just trying to, and I, and I appreciate you answering my question. What I'm trying to do is basically, you know, I think what the court has to do is we have to kind of balance the 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 the, the right of a property owner or an acquired property owner versus basically the impact of that property on other people. And I, you know, I understand what Lansing says. I understand what I want to hear is from you as to what you think this should be in terms of, you know, applying the statutes and applying Lansing, applying the cases that you're applying. What would this opinion say? You know, if I, if I acquire land on the water, <clears throat> like these folks did, and, you know, there are some concerns that arise kind of within the community, what would an opinion say that would basically give very specific direction as to a new property owner or, or a person who's acquiring land as to what they can or cannot do and what they should be cognizant could actually happen when they acquire the property? Oh, thanks, Justice Bernstein, for that clarification. Um, and the I think the answer is uh, the ability to develop the property is um, based it contained within the townships, in this case, the township zoning ordinance and the provisions and requirements of the ordinance. And so uh, they obviously have certain rights under that ordinance and there's certain processes under that ordinance that they go through to, to apply for their development. And you know, if I'm, if, if I'm advising somebody on what they can and can't do, that's the first place to look. And the process that we're talking about is, is an appeal from a decision under those, under those uh, regulations. And one of the things that I think is critically important here is that the, the, the substantive merits of the case, which haven't been addressed, are fundamentally about whether or not the township actually applied the requirements in its, in, in its zoning ordinance. And, and so uh, that's a little bit separate and distinct about what the person can and can't do with their property uh, because it's, uh, well, it relates to what they can and can't do under the zoning ordinance. But in this case, the, the, the township just made a mistake. They just didn't apply their zoning ordinance as written and, and this is a challenge to it. So, um, you know, I think that uh, people ought to be advised they need to comply with the, the township zoning requirements. And if they don't, then there's an avenue for potential appeal um, based on the agreed party status of the of the uh, person challenging that decision. Council, thank you very much. Justice Clement. No questions. Justice Kavanaugh. Um, I have one, and I guess I think it's it's a it's a little bit further or, or expanding on what Justice Bernstein was getting at of of what standard, in your opinion, would you have this court write? 
for determining what is aggrieved. I think it's 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 fairly obvious as you it, in the example you gave of sort of how to define it at the edges, right? The person, uh, property owner adjoining the particular development is is in the in the zone of whatever standard we describe you in Traverse City or you know me on the east side of the state is out there's a lot of ground in between um, those two sort of endpoints so how would we draw what standard would apply I mean, the community at large or the citizenry at large what community are we talking about how do we draw those um, you know, how do we come up with a standard that actually makes, uh, that provides guidance of what that, that um, boundary is? Uh, thanks, Justice Kavanaugh. And I, I'd start with the, the language from Lansing. Um, and, that, and I think that if you take that and sort of combine it with what the court's saying in Olson, you would have something that reads along the lines of an aggrieved party is someone who's, who uh, ha has suffered some special damages or may suffer some special damages not common to members of the general public or not common to, not common to uh, members of the citizenry at large to use the specific term in Lansing. So uh, that's how I would set that forth. Now, uh, application of that is, is part of the work of the trial court and, and the factual determinations that get made at that level. Um, and I was mentioning uh, in my response to, to Justice Bernstein's question, this, uh, the, the law review note that's cited in the, um, in the, in one of the amicus briefs and also in the, uh, in the, um, sorry, it's the, the un or not the younger, the Joseph opinion. Um, and, and there's a section that says standing to appeal, uh, and it says a nearby landowner normally has standing as an aggrieved person. In fact, one commentator has referred to such property owners as private attorneys general asserting the public interest. If the property owner's land abuts the land in question, the mere fact of proximity without further proof of special damage has often been, has often been sufficient to support his appeal. If he does not abut, however, the requirement for standing may be more stringent. It appears that a non-abutting property owner must allege both proximity and special damage for prima facie status as an aggrieved person. To satisfy the special damage element, the third party appellant must suffer some injury particular to his own property or, or more substantial than suffered by the community at large. All of that is, a, I think, a, a helpful way of saying there's something of a sliding scale here, obviously, and those are factual determines, determinations that are made at the trial court level. And that's the job of the trial court is to, to evaluate the facts presented to them and fit them into that standard as, as appropriate. Okay, and included within that factual sort of determination, one of the potentially relevant facts would be the nature of the development itself, right? I mean, there may be a difference between absolutely you know, dredging out a sand dune for a marina as opposed to, you know, building a your cottage on on a particular piece of property. And that I, may be relevant to the question of special damages. I think that's absolutely relevant and and, and particularly appropriate for the trial court to take into consideration. Okay. Thank you. Justice Welch. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Howard, I, I, I know where Justice Bernstein and Kavanaugh have always already hit on this a bit, but I'm going to keep narrowing it, I think, which we're trying to do. So in this instance, if you were in front of the trial court and allowed to proceed in this action, who would you, who would you advocate is the community here that's measured against? Is it Sagatuck Township? Is it everybody who lives along the Kalamazoo River? Is it the sort of well, I'll call it the Metro Saugatuck area, to use that loosely, given it's a small community. What, wh who's the community here? So uh, I, I th that's a great question. And I think that, again, there's that, there's that sliding scale. As you are closer in proximity to the development, you are, you're going to have a greater, just by uh, that, that very nature, you're going to have a greater likelihood of um, having standing to appeal. In, 
I don't think I would suggest that the court draw a, a, a specific boundary when it talks about the community at large, but it really is uh, it, it really is the community in general, the community in the surrounding area to the proposed development. And the, the closer you get to the development, I think the less, the more likely you're going to have to, um, you're, you're going to have a, it, have standing, have a unique injury that's redressable. There's, there's a couple of different parts there. One of which is to say, do you have some injury that's different than uh, the community at large? That's one part of the question, but what is that special damage? Is that a legitimate special damage? And is it, you know, recognizable? And is it, you know, this is where in our brief, we talk about the distinction between the, the type of injury and the degree of injury. And I think that, that it's really important to focus on those factual determinations to say, what's your degree of injury as it relates to this particular problem and how is it different than the citizenry at large? So I wouldn't say that there's an absolute boundary on those on the citizenry at large, but again, it really is the closer you get, the the more likely it is that you're going to be able to establish that you have special damages. I, I, thank you, I appreciate that, um, and, and recognize that it's it, it, it's a challenging concept for us to define sitting here today. Um, what I want to turn to next is the notion um, of special damages, and uh, we've obviously seen some briefing in this case that brings up the issue of environmental issues. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what sort of harms could potentially play into a case like this. Yeah, I think that, the, I mean, environmental harms are are really important in a case like this, and, you, and when you see things like, you know, for example, the, the dredging part of the allegations in the affidavits is that the dredging of the marina is going to impact the, the uh, nearby preserves that contain globally rare resources uh, and, and wetlands. And that honestly has borne itself out through uh, other proceedings. But the important part there is that there is substantial damage that potentially is happening to those particular properties. And people who have a unique interest in those, like the late Senator Patty Burkholz, have should have the ability to say we need to protect this resource this community resource and i have a unique interest in it that's going to be harmed differently than the community at large if this project goes through and so therefore i meet that gatekeeping threshold of the of being able to actually file the appeal okay thank you i'll let other uh, folks uh, get a chance to finish their questions um justice zara no questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, Justice, oh, I started with you, Justice Viviano. I don't have to go back to you. <laughs> Unless you have questions. When you're, no. Okay. Um, thank you, counsel. We have gone over your time. Um, Mr. Straub, Mr. Gerval Reich, I don't know how you're going to divide your time, but I'll let you decide that and tell me and get going. Yes, Chief Justice, we've agreed that I will go first. I'm going to try to reserve seven and a half minutes of time for Mr. Straub. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Jane on behalf that doesn't of sound good. On behalf of North Shores of Sargatuck, may it please the court. There is absolutely no indication that the legislature intended the term aggrieved to have any meaning other than the well-established one that existed in zoning law when it enacted the Zoning Enabling Act in 2006. And that meaning was that you had to show special damages to be aggrieved. So for this court to substitute its own standard in Lansing schools, as the appellants would like, for the one that the legislature chose would be exactly the opposite of what the court said it should do in Lansing schools. The, the point of that decision was that when the legislature has chosen a standard, this court will not superimpose its own and the court should continue to abide by that principle here. We actually agree with appellants that the special damages standard that is longstanding in Michigan is very well articulated in the majority opinion in Mays. So to answer your question, Justice Bernstein, you've actually already written the opinion. It's in Mays. Uh, you, can, you can take that and you can apply it here. The, there is one additional element, however, that's not in Mays and that the appellant has failed to grapple with to this point, and that's that you have to be aggrieved by the decision you're appealing. You can't just be aggrieved by the fact that the property will be developed. And if the court wants an excellent example of that, it should look at the decisions that were recently made in Kingsbury County Day School and Baker, which are cited in pages 24 and 25 and discussed therein of the Michigan 
municipal leagues brief. We, because appellant has not shown any special damage from the specific decisions of the planning commission, which were to approve a, a particular configuration of homes that uh, otherwise could be developed on the property by right in a different configuration, or to approve a special marina, a, um, excuse me, a, a, a private marina in a boat basin that has to be authorized by Eagle and the Army Corps of Engineer, we respectfully request that the Corps deny leave. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you, Council. Justice Viviano. Uh, no questions. Thank you, Council. Justice Bernstein. Hey, Council. Good morning and welcome. I, you know, I like to, as I did in Mays, I like to keep things very practical and I like to keep things in a manner that, you know, are just easy to understand. I always think the simpler, the better. And I'm just going to ask you kind of the same question um, that, you know, I asked Brother Council, which is ultimately, if you were to write an opinion on this, and again, I understand, you know, you know, you're going to go back to Mays, but what I want to understand is the real life implications for property owners, people who live in the community and people who are affected by it. So ex explain to me exactly if you're building a marina, you have a large scale project, explain to me exactly who very specifically if I were to write an opinion and it was, you know, the opinion that you were hoping to, to see, give me very specifics as to just exactly who it is that would be able to object to this development. Someone who suffers special damage from the, the, from the decision that has been made uh, in this case, okay? It's not, the question is not who, who can challenge the development. The question is who can challenge the decision of the planning commission. Right. Now the analysis yeah. ought to be, does the alleged harm arise from the decision appeal? That's the first question. So to take a specific example, the laydown area that they have complained about, they complain about uh, dust coming from the laydown area. The laydown area was not approved by the planning commission. That's not, that's not something the planning commission authorized. So it's not something that they can use as a reason or being aggrieved by the planning commission's decision. The boat basin, they claim there are gonna be hydrological effects from the boat basin on DNR's property to the north. The boat basin was not authorized by the planning commission. No, but Council, I guess my question is, and I, know I totally understand your position and I totally understand you know, your argument. What I'm trying to, to get across is very specific. What specific party would have the right to challenge this under your description or under your definition? Like who in the community, who would have the right to object? If I were to write an opinion the exactly way, exact way you wanted it, not, I understand the standard, but I'm trying to understand specifically who would it be? Well, if we're using the facts of this case, I, I, yeah. can't, I, can't, I can't identify anyone because there is no special damage resulting from this. All of the effects are the ordinary effects, the incidental effects that you would expect from development of the property, which can happen by right, whether there's a special uh, approval use of a marina or not, and whether there's a, a, a different configuration of homes or not. So it's very difficult for me. I would have to, I would have to have a different example. Let's, well, let, can we use, uh, let's use the, the Baker versus Bainbridge, Township of Bainbridge case, okay? okay. There was a variance granted in that case that allowed the cellular tower to be closer to the property line than it otherwise uh, was allowed. And what that meant was that the cell tower would, if it fell, it would fall into someone else's property as a direct result of the decision to allow the cell tower to be closer to the property line. That is a case where that person is specially damaged by that decision. Um, they have a legally protected interest to use and enjoyment of their property. There's a, this is a classic nuisance situation where you're concerned about a present menace that might that might hurt you when you when you're using your property, and and it comes directly it's directly a result of the decision that was made. You answered my question. Thank you, Council. Justice Clement. No questions. Thank you. Justice Kavanaugh. Um, good good morning. I, I I'm wondering if you can help me. Um, uh, understand or, or what's your argument for, I hear you say that the legislature in 2006 
had this well-established meaning of what aggrieved was, and that's what the legislature intended to adopt. I'm struggling with that because by my read, and tell me if I'm wrong, we have four Court of Appeals opinions uh, that primarily rely on each other uh, over a period of about, what is it, four years, uh, five years. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling to see how that establishes that the term aggrieved requ- uh, sort of attained this unique legal meaning that um, the legislature therefore intended to incorporate that into the statute. Tell me why that's not true. Well, if we were back in time in the 60s and 70s when those decisions were made, uh, I think there would be a different analysis going on uh, because the legislature hadn't weighed in at that point. It had passed the statute, said aggrieved, court interpreted it. This court deciding the legislature intended something different from what the Court of Appeals said would have been reasonable. But at this point, the legislature changed the standard because of one of those decisions, and then it changed it back in 2006 and readopted the standard in one section and then and changed it in another to be more precise. At, at that point, when, 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 when Representative, if it was you know, Chief Justice McCormick, Representative McCormick was asking, well, you know, her, her, her uh, staff, what does this term aggrieved mean? They would have gone and looked at the opinions on what the term aggrieved means in the zoning context, and they would have known exactly what it means. And you, we have to presume that the legislature did exactly that, that when they put aggrieved into the Zoning Enabling Act, they knew that there was a specific interpretation of this that applied in the zoning context. And if they wanted a, a different definition, they easily could have defined it in the statute. They did not. And when they don't define it, the Oops, you muted yourself, I think, accidentally. Or should presume that they mean the uh, the well-established meaning to apply. Well-established by four Court of Appeals opinions. I mean, I get that that's all we had, right? I mean, is the legislature saying, well, we don't have something from the Supreme Court on it, but it this, is, this is what it is. It was Michigan law. That okay. was the law. And okay. Right? Even when the Supreme Court has not weighed in, it's the law until the Supreme Court does. Until we so do. So that was that was the law at the time when it, in 2006. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gerville Reese. Do you want to let uh, Mr. Straub take yes. the rest of the questions? Yes, I'm I just I want to make sure. Okay, I want, um, I want uh, to honor that 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 request. Yes. Okay, um, Justice Welch. Um, I, I'll go ahead, and um, I think a lot has been covered already, and uh, love to hear from Mr. Straub if possible. Well, let me um, let me start by first of all, may it please the court. Uh, Justice Bernstein um, has been persistent on this issue. What would you have us do? And um, my response to that, on behalf of Sagata- the metropolitan area of Sagatuck Township, whichever Justice indicated that, uh, would be this: uh, look at the decision in Olson. Uh, I thought that um, Justice Godola did a great job in articulating that in uh, the Olson opinion, the page 185 uh, of that opinion. It appears, the large quote appears on page 24 of the township supplemental brief. This is not, this is not an area of the law that um, you can draw, easily draw four corners around and say, this is a, the perfect square we have answered every question um, that could ever come up. You can't do that because we're dealing with property rights. Property rights are individual and, and very distinct in the law, as you all understand and know. And it's those property rights that put this apart from the general appellate standards that, um, that the alliance, the uh, SDCA, wants this to harmonize with. I don't think it can harmonize with it. It's a property right, real estate property. And I believe that Justice Godola had done an excellent job in going back and admittedly, as Justice Kavanaugh has pointed out, there isn't a whole lot of, there isn't a whole lot of common law here, but what there is was well refined by by, uh, Justice Godola in his opinion. I would urge the court to do what it did back in 2019 and essentially acknowledge and give the nod to that decision 
as being the best effort to date to accommodate what the legislature adopted in 2006. The legislature gave a clear-cut signal on that statute because it did make a change from the 1943 statute for the Township Zoning um, uh, Act. It made that standard of the Green Party the standard. It clearly broke from the prior statute. And when that happens, it's presumed, I believe the Palmer case speaks right to that. When the legislature takes those kinds of steps and doesn't say something contrary to the common law in the statute, which in 2006 is not, then the court is required to go back to the common law standard, which admittedly, as Justice Kavanaugh points out, was not really uh, robust, but it was there. And what we have has been crystallized well in that Olson opinion. That's my comment on that. I, if there are other questions, Justice Wells, I'm sure if I got off on that, missed your question, but I think that covers the essence of this. To try to harmonize this with non-property issues, I think is inappropriate. And one other comment, while well, I have a few seconds left, there was a comment about environmental impact. And indeed that is, that is at issue in this particular case. But the zoning statute doesn't deal with environmental impact. Those are issues that are dealt with by other statutory enactments, both state and federal, which have their own hearing systems, which have their own rules, regulations, and appellate issues and standards. We're dealing here with a property issue. Does this affect and provide a special these actions by the zoning um, the Planning Commission, do those affect, uh, provide special damages not sustained by other people, uh, property owners at all? And we don't have any of that here. The uh, Zoning Board of Appeals properly denied standing. I'll be happy to answer any other questions. We don't have a lot of time. But I apologize if I ran over. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question. Sure. Well, let's uh, let me just start with an observation. I understand you like the Olson case, but it seems to me Olson talked about community members, and that might have been overly broad because the parties there were all property owners. But let's just get back to this uh, notion of, of Joseph and a grief party. I, I think what you're arguing is that a grief party has become a legal term of art. Um, it, what what is it that that takes us to that conclusion. What is there any laws or any rules on and when a, a phrase becomes a legal term of art uh, where we look to the case law as opposed to uh, just the plain language, the plain meaning of what a grief party means? Because um, the, the, the way I see it, the plain meaning of, of, of party aggrieved on its face does not have a similarly situated property owner requirement. Well, I disagree. If you if you look at the uh, township's brief, I believe I uh, addressed the the similar standards because there's nothing precisely identical in Ohio, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin uses a different standard. Is that what I'm? Am I answering your question, Justice? Well, no, well I don't. I'm not a big fan of going to look to other states to tell me what our legislature meant. Well, right, and I agree with that, but we're not out of we're not out of keeping with others. But I would simply say this that we can look at the dictionary definition. That's one of the things that we can do to establish what the party is. We can look at the source of the term. The source seems to have come from the Standard Zoning Act that was uh, that was recommended by the United States Department of Commerce back in the Hoover uh, presidency uh, period. I mean, we can go to all that history. There's a, uh, a Michigan Law Review article that's much cited and uh, referred and assessed that in the mid 60s. These are all things that go toward that definition, uh, I would argue, respectfully. Thank you. Are there additional questions for Mr. Straub or Mr. Gurlrich? I assume either of you would be happy to answer any. Okay, thank you all for your presentations. The case will be submitted.